Okay. So, um, so first of all, I want to remind you that uh, we're not meeting at the regular time on Thursday. Um, it says on the syllabus, I'm going to give a makeup lecture on Monday, and that will be via Zoom. So, uh, Zoom link is uh, on the syllabus. Do you want me to send out an invitation? Yeah. It will be, it will be at the regular time, but on Monday. And you know it will be recorded, so if you can't make it, okay. at that time. Uh, um, uh, and, uh, this is important. I'll come back to you guys. <laughs> All right. Um, so basically, like. Uh, this um, reading was about Hobbes on religion. Um, and, uh, you know, what he says about religion is pretty complicated and confusing, actually. Um, but I'm going to start with this that he makes. Um, uh, well, he makes three distinctions between different types of religion, but it's not clear exactly um, how they go together. So, first of all, he makes a distinction between um, religion and superstition. He actually makes this distinction more than once and not in the same way. So that's what I'm going to talk about. Um, second of all, he makes a distinction between true religion and false religion. And finally, he makes a distinction between natural religion and revealed religion. So of course he didn't invent any of these distinctions, uh, but as usual he's like defining terms in a certain way, um, and uh, in particular on the first one he actually defines it three different ways. So that's kind of confusing. It's certainly not in line with his official advice about how to define things. <laughs> but uh, but you can guess that he has some special purpose for doing that. So the first one is make or he makes the distinction depend on individual opinion. This is chapter 11, paragraph 26 on page 63. Um, very near the end of chapter 11. And this fear of things invisible. So he's just got, he's just explained before this why it is that people start to become afraid of invisible uh, things that may affect them. And then he says, and this fear of things invisible is the natural seed of that which everyone in himself calleth religion, and in, that, and in them that worship or fear that power otherwise than they do, superstition. Right? So here the distinction between religion and superstition is um, everyone's afraid of invisible things. Um, out of that, I built something that I call religion. Other people 
we do it differently, differently than we, I call that superstition. So it's kind of like the way this, he defined good and evil before, right? Like, you know, what you call religion is gonna be what I call superstition. What I call religion is gonna be what you call superstition. Um, second way he defines it, this actually comes earlier in the text, but it's the one I'm gonna talk about second. In chapter six, um, he makes that this distinction depend on the authority of the sovereign. So this is chapter six, paragraph 36. Fear of, of power invisible, feigned by the mind, or imagined from tales publicly allowed, religion. This is part of a long list of definitions of like various passions. Whatever, right? So, um, so he's defining in this paragraph 36, he's defining religion and superstition. Fear of power invisible, feigned by the mind or imagined from tales publicly allowed, religion, not allowed, superstition. And then he adds, and when the power imagined is truly such as we imagine, true religion. Um, <clears throat> So, um, although given this definition, right, he should also um, put in true superstition, <laughs> right? So the, the, the definition here is that um, if you're afraid of invisible powers, either because you just imagine them yourself or because you've heard uh, public tales about them. Um, well, sorry, if you've heard tales. Yeah. Actually, I never noticed this about this definition before. There's something weird there. If it's just feigned by the mind, he doesn't make a distinction between allowed and not allowed. I guess because you're allowed to be afraid of whatever you want as long as you don't act on it. <laughs> so, but if the if the fear is based on tales that are publicly allowed, it's called religion. If it's based on tales that are not allowed, it's called superstition. And allowed or not allowed obviously means by the sovereign. Um, and like I said, then he says, if the power you imagine is truly such as you imagine, that's called true religion. That, of course, would be in the case where it's based on tales that are publicly allowed. If you, if based on tales that are not publicly allowed, you hear something and it's truly such as you imagine, I guess that would be called true superstition. But it doesn't actually make so, um, so the point is, so the, in the, the first case, like everyone decides for themselves what religion is and they call, you know, their own form of fear and visible, of invisible powers and what they think you should do about it, religion and everyone else is superstition. But in the second one, the distinction is whether um, you got this fear by a publicly allowed method or not. Um, In the third place, now, this, it's not 100% clear that this belongs in this series, but I think it does, and I'm going to try to explain what it's doing here. Um, chapter 12, paragraph 8, on page 65, he makes the distinction between religion and superstition um, depend on the difference between reason and experience or that is between science and mere prudence. This, um, so he says, men that know not what it is that we call causing, that is almost all men, have no other rule to guess by, but by observing and remembering what they have seen to perceive the like effect at some other time or times before. 
without seeing between the antecedent and subsequent event any dependence or connection at all. Right? So most people who don't have true science and don't know that cause is a matter of inferring things from the definition of words, which therefore can't go wrong, um, try to understand what causes what by uh, experiments, by empirical method, which is seeing what usually comes before what. And therefore, from the like things past, they expect the like things to come and hope for good or evil luck superstitiously from things that have no part at all in the cause of them. Right? So here, superstition is, he doesn't mention religion, but religion and superstition are, you know, as you see from those other two places, they, they do go together. They are, they, like, they're opposites somehow. And in chapter 12, he's saying that superstition is when uh, based merely on prudence or experience, you start to expect good or bad luck from certain causes. So, um, um, whereas on the other hand, presumably religion would be where you only use reason for that. Um, so, uh, so like the first two, maybe I should write these up here. The first one was chapter 11, paragraph 26. Right, the distinction was based on individual opinion. The second one was chapter six, paragraph 36. And the difference was based on authority of the sovereign. And the last one I just read was from chapter 12, paragraph 8. And it's based on reason versus experience. Again, this is what I said about Hobbes' epistemology to begin with. He's not an empiricist, he's a rationalist, right? He thinks all true knowledge is based on reason and what we get from experience is not true knowledge, but mere prudence. Um, uh, and yeah, as you can see from here, he thinks mere prudence is not reliable. It leads to superstitious fears and hopes. Um, because uh, the things that come before any given event, are, a lot of things come before. And this, by this means of mere experience, he's saying you can't tell which ones are actually related. So, you know, you saw a black crow fly on your left and then something bad happened. So you think, oh, the black crow on the left preceded the bad thing happening. And in the future, when you see the black crow on the left, the granule will be worried something bad's gonna happen. Um, this, this is like a rationalist character of how empirical science works. <laughs> Although, I mean, a lot of, you know, empiricist explanations of how empirical science work make it sound like it would work that way. Right, like they don't mention controlled experiments or you know whatever. All right, so anyway, sorry, back back to Hobbes though. So um, so on, at least on the first two explanations, the difference between religion and superstition is relative. It depends either in this case it depends on who you're asking, or in this case it depends on what commonwealth you're asking. Um, on the other hand, the way he defines the distinction between true religion and false religion also here was not relative, right? He says it's true religion if things are really are the way you imagine. But of course, um, 
if I'm, let's say, the person who's making this distinction between religion and superstition, um, I'm going to think that my religion is true. Right? I mean, like, uh, by definition, I imagine that the power I've imagined is really the way I imagine it. I don't imagine that it's different from how I imagine it. Right? So if you ask me, um, is which is true religion, religion or superstition? I'm going to say, well, religion. At least that's what I'm going to say in a state of nature. And I think that is probably the difference between these two definitions. Right? In chapter 11, where he's starting to talk about the origin of religion, he's talking about how, you know, how things would be in a state of nature. If I'm in a commonwealth and you ask me which religion is true religion, I'm going to think, um, well, I may think about what I think is the true religion, but I'm also going to think about the consequences of saying that a certain religion is true. And if the sovereign has said that a certain religion is true and you're not supposed to say otherwise, then I'm going to realize that uh, I should say what the sovereign wants to do, not what I think. Otherwise, there'll be bad consequences. So in this case, also, if you ask me, you know, which is true and which, which is true, religion or superstition, I'm going to say religion, meaning whatever the sovereign said, you're allowed to believe. Well, you're allowed to see, I mean, Hobbes, actually, he emphasizes this in many places. He says that there can't be a command to believe something. This is uh, actually something that's been debated back and forth. <laughs> uh, uh, well, both in the history of Christianity and Judaism and, and philosophical tradition, but you know, but you can see at least where he's coming from. He says it can't be a command to believe something. Like you either believe it or you don't. You can't be like, well, I won't believe it because of the bad consequences. You already believe it. <laughs> so, um, so, so the sovereign can't tell you what religion to to think is true, but the sovereign can, and Hobbes thinks the sovereign should tell you what religion to say is true. And you should do it. <laughs> Otherwise, civil war. So, um, So even though, like, on either of these two understandings, there's no actual connection between this distinction and this distinction, right? Like, what I call religion could be true or false. What I call superstition could be true or false. Um, nevertheless, there's going to be, um, uh, everyone's going to say there's a thing wrong with it. When you ask them. Um, now, on the other hand, for this one, um, religion, that is, beliefs based on reason are um, going to be true. Whereas beliefs based on experience, that is superstition, are, well, they could be true. But if they are, it's kind of by accident. 
right? So again, in that paragraph on page 30, I'm uh, sorry, on um, chapter six, page, page 31. And when the power imagined is truly such as we imagine, true religion, right? So like, um, if religion is defined in one of these ways, then if the power you imagine is truly the way you imagine it, that's um, just kind of a delinquent. So, you know, your religion could be true religion. But there's nothing about the fact that it's called religion that makes it true, right? The fact that it's called religion is either because it's your belief and not someone else's, or because it's what the sovereign told people to say, not what the sovereign told them not to say. Neither of those have any particular necessary connection with being true. But on the other hand, if we make the distinction this way, then it's going to turn out that religion um, is. Uh, always true and superstition is could be true but only by accident it's likely false um, so right away you can kind of get a sense of why he um is being a little tricky with his definitions here, right? I mean, uh, he doesn't want to say the religion that sovereign tells you to believe in is probably false because you're not allowed to say it. Um, but, uh, and the true religion is something that you don't need a sovereign to command you because it's like the voice of reason, right? But he, so he doesn't want to say that, but on the other hand, uh, um, he's letting you conclude that if you think about it. Yeah. So why, why would false religion even be a thing then? If the sovereign can declare that there is a true religion, right? I guess I should say, I mean, the truth is, and maybe this is not by accident, in that paragraph where he defines true religion, he doesn't actually mention false religion, right? He just says true religion is when the power is actually the way you imagine. It. I, I assume that when it's not, it's false religion, right? So, um, but yeah again you're right where you know like um if you use religion in one of these ways then um you're not going to have the use for the phrase false religion because um you know you're going to call the beliefs like this that you think are false superstition <laughs> yeah Oh, yeah, no, I should have just. I guess I should discuss that today, shouldn't I? Um, the thing is, I didn't print it out of anything. So. <laughs> uh. Can't mirror live Zoom while you're recording the meeting. Okay. Um, uh, yeah, let me break. You're right. I should talk about that. Can I get back to how the So 
So, um, I mean, assignment is pretty straightforward. It's, uh, you have a you have a choice, answer one of the questions in two to three pages. There are, how many questions? Five questions. Um, and do we need to have a bunch of cited quotations in those responses or are they just like an open-ended kind of response um it's it's definitely best if you can cite the text um and quote it if it's if the words are necessary to to make your point um if not you can right i mean it's it's hard to it's hard to say exactly when to i think there's something about this my faq but i'm not sure it's very helpful but like it's hard to know exactly when you need to actually put the words in and when you can just say where it is um but yeah it's definitely ideal to 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 sh one way or another to show where your answer is coming from the text um, um, you know, if you don't, it's not as good, but <laughs> that's like, it doesn't, doesn't mean if you don't, you fail, but it's not as good. Uh, let's see. Um, and, um, you know, so this isn't really a paper. It's really kind of a take home midterm exam, right? I mean, the point is just to answer the question. So you don't have to have like a title and a bibliography and all that stuff, right? I mean, you, if, if you cite, well, so if you cite this book, you can just use like the chapter and paragraph number or page and or page number. If you cite something else, you have to give enough information that we can tell you can find it if you have to. That's I don't care about the format of it or anything. Um, you know, as I think I said at the beginning, I don't encourage you to like, I mean, you should be able to to you should in theory be able to answer these questions just using the texts and plus like what I've said about them, but uh um, I don't encourage you to, to, I don't know if it'll help that much to like go through Stanford Encyclopedia or, you know, Wikipedia or whatever, but, um, but I mean, you, or whatever other source you want. I mean, you know, so I don't encourage it, but if you do, okay, that's fine, but obviously make sure to cite it. Um, and, um, And it's to be handed in via canvas. And I think, th yeah. Is it double space? Double space. <laughs> um, so, you know, like uh, two to three pages is, yeah, it actually says double space. <laughs> um, two to three pages is uh, like, it's basically like a guide to how much of an answer this is supposed to be you know i mean don't like don't like start putting in tiny spaces between the letters to make it <laughs> be the right number of pages i mean uh I, um it's just like you know think about how much of an answer you need for a two to three page answer um are there any other questions about this other questions about the individual questions that you have a choice of yes yeah that's right it's just it's just like an essay essay question or like a long answer question right so yeah just get to the point 
Um, and, and, you know, the questions are, are pretty specific. So like on the one hand, you don't have to uh, know everything about what Hobbes says to answer the question. But like on the other hand, you shouldn't start summarizing everything Hobbes says, it's not relevant. Um, and yeah, I don't, I've noticed, I've noted some problems that made some of these too hard the last two times and tried to fix them, but I, yeah, it's a work in progress. Um, okay, any other questions? Yeah. Being that the last question is kind of a little bit ambiguous, like in uh, number five, it's kind of complex. Um, would you say that's like more of a risk to answer that one in comparison to like number one, which is super easy to answer? <laughs> I, you know, I mean, because uh, I'd love to answer number five, but I'm I'm reluctant to want to take the uh, the the jump, hoping I'd get it right, as opposed to one or two, which are guaranteed easy answers. <laughs> well, I yeah. So um, um, I mean, we will take that into account in grading it. That some of them are harder, and fewer people do them. So I mean. Uh, so I hope that helps to balance that out a little bit, but you know, but I can't advise you to, to answer the question if, if you're not sure what it means. <laughs> like, but if you think you understand it, or if you want to ask me about it, if there's something you don't understand, you can ask me about it now or later. Uh, but, but if you think you understand it, and you think you know the answer, go for it. I think, you know, I think five isn't really that hard. It just looks hard because of the symbols and the, you know, like the letter L. There's not a lot of symbols, but there's one symbol. <laughs> uh, and sorry, what was the other question? Oh, yes, submitted by Canvas. And I think I remember to create the assignment at the beginning of the year, but if not, I will create it. Let's see. Oh, and I remember the other thing I was going to say at the beginning of the class too, which is that, so the reading for next time, which again is Monday, the reading is for the first reading from Locke, and there's some reading that's not from the book that I heard for the course, but it's up on Canvas and there's now links to it from the syllabus. It looks like I did not create any assignments, so I have to create the assignments so you can submit. Thanks. Anything else? Okay. Um, okay. In that case, back to this. Uh, what was I talking about? Um, a natural living versus a real living. Well, yeah, so I didn't get to this yet. Um, and I'm not going to get to it yet, but I'll get back to it. I'm still talking about these two. So, um, um, so in chapter 12, when uh, Hobbes talks about the origin of religion, now, I mean, remember this quote is from chapter 12. So, but, um, uh, but in chapter 12 as a whole, when Hobbes talks about the origin of religion, he's actually talking about the origin of superstition in this sense, right? If we, I mean, again, I'm filling this in. All he says is that you know, since people don't know what causes what causation is, they they form superstitious beliefs. I'm just assuming in this context that we're supposed to understand that if you used reason instead, you you could form beliefs that would be true, you know, properly called religious and not superstitious. So most of chapter 12 is about the origin of 
about this origin of religion. So it's about the origin of what could be called superstition in this sense. Um, I mean, I guess it's a, like, so it does have something to do with this distinction in that both of these are natural, right? That is, he explains in most of chapter 12 where this comes from by talking about human nature and what it is we tend to be afraid of and so forth. And he explains where this comes from also by talking about human nature and how we can use reason to think about the causes of things. So it's both natural religion or natural religion and natural superstition, right? In other words, so far revealed religion has not turned up. Um, okay, so, um, so the natural origin of superstition that i mean again this is superstition in this sense I should have some terms for this but no but so anyway the origin of i mean because in chapter 12 pop says i'm talking about the origin of religion right so in that case he's i guess is using religion in this sense actually Right, the origin of each person's, each individual's religion, how um, the seeds of religion, um, and um, so he says it has three roots, and he emphasizes that they're all peculiar to humans. Now, I mean, why emphasize that? I'm not sure, but I'm, I guess it's to emphasize the role of reason here. But so true religion is going to result from the proper use of the distinctively human faculty of reason. But uh, uh, natural superstition is gonna result from a natural misuse of human faculty of reason. I think that's what he's emphasizing. I'm not sure. I mean, like, but I mean, you see why I'm asking this question, right? Like, why? Who thought that when we started a discussion of religion that we were going to talk about squirrel religion or horse religion or whatever, right? I mean, you know, I mean, maybe some, maybe they have a religion or whatever, but like, <laughs> who mentioned that? <laughs> so, but he, but he, like, he starts by saying, you know. Since there are no traces of religion in other animals, we have to look for the origin of specific human faculty. So I'm just guessing what's going on there. He's trying to he's trying to emphasize that this is a way that um, only a potentially rational creature can go wrong. Um, and so it's I guess in a way not surprising that the first two of the three roots are actually involved in um, religion in this sense too. It's only really the third one that leads to superstition, I think. So because the first one, so these are all near the beginning of chapter 12. The first one is in paragraph two on page 63. First, it is peculiar to the nature of man to be inquisitive into the causes of the, the events they see, some more, some less, but all men so much as to be curious in search of the causes of their own good and evil fortune. Um, this is something he already said before is distinctive of humans and other animals don't do it. At least that's his claim that other animals don't do it. That when something happens, we wonder why did that happen? And how do we know that other animals don't do it? <laughs> like the famous thing from Wittgenstein about do we know so much about the soul of the dog? Uh, I, I, I don't know, but anyway. Um, uh,
three views. One is inquisitiveness. Dot causes. And the second is upon the sight of anything that hath a beginning, to think also it had a cause, which determined the same to begin then when it did, rather than sooner or later. So this might kind of sound, almost sound like the same thing back again, right? But it's not exactly the same. This is when we see something, we wonder what the cause was. This is, we're sure there was a cause. Um, principle of causality. I was just talking about this in my seminar. Um, it's all about causality this quarter. Um, uh, about opinions about causality in Scotland after Hume. <laughs> I don't know. Anyway, um, so, uh, um, right, human, human beings, uh, Hobbes says, tend to be certain that if, if something, if, if there was an event, there was something there now that wasn't there before. There must have been a cause. Um, so it's the third root that represents relying on mere experience. This is paragraph four on page 62. Um, man observeth how one event hath been produced by another and remembereth in them antecedents and consequence. And when he cannot assure himself of the true causes of things, for the causes of good and evil fortune for the most part are invisible. He supposes causes of them, either such as his own fancy suggesteth, or trusteth to the authority of other men, such as he thinks to be his friends and wiser than himself. Right? It's important that he has, thinks of them not only to be wiser than himself, but also his friends, because if they're wiser than himself, but not his friends, they could be lying. Right? So he's looking for someone who might know the true cause and wouldn't lie to him about it. Um, so, uh, um, is, is there someone? Oh no, I was outside. Um, right, so by experience, um, I start noticing which things come before which things, or which, which things come after which things. And uh, if I don't know what really makes the event necessary, I'll like invent something based on that. Or someone else can get me to believe something based on that. If I think they're wiser, I know my friend. So um, right, it's this plus these two things that make that happen. I notice that things sometimes come after other things, whatever. And I'm really wonder what the cause of things are. And I'm sure there is a cause. So uh, like, in the absence of anything else to go on, I start looking in my experience for things that might be the cause. So, um,
That results in superstition in this sense. What results in reason in this sense? I guess I agree with that. It's, the, it's one and two plus a different three. Reason takes over here instead of experience. So how does this work? Um, So, um, he already said in chapter five that one and two by themselves are peculiar to human beings, but that reasoning or reckoning goes beyond them somehow. This is chapter five, paragraph six on page 24. I have said before, that a man did excel all other animals in this faculty, that when he, faculty just means like power, in this faculty, that when he conceived anything whatsoever, he was apt to inquire the consequences of it and what effects he could do with it. And now I add this other degree of the same excellence, that he can by words reduce the consequences he finds the general rules called theorems or aphorisms, that is, he can reason or reckon, not only in number, but in all other things whereof one may be added onto or subtracted from another. So, um, so again, this is like, this is like a more excellent, this is like a rudimentary use of the peculiarly human faculty but then it goes off track when you try to finish it using this, but a more excellent version of it is this, and this is um, reasoning about causes using words and their definition. Yeah. Um, I guess I'm a little confused because I thought that like in order for there to be a sovereign state, then everyone needs to be able to use reason like as a whole rather than just by like separate people and stuff like that. And this kind of seems like there's like a state of the nature existing within the sovereign state because people, some people are using reason and other people are using experience. Right, well, I mean, I think um, the, the function of religion in a commonwealth is going to have something to do with that issue. Right, with the fact that I mean, so obviously when he says most people don't know how to reason about causes and effects, he doesn't mean like, I mean, or, or, or maybe I guess I should say that this experience doesn't always lead you wrong, right? In everyday matters, experience is mostly good enough. So, um, so people mostly know what to expect. And that's enough for the covenant to, to work in theory, right? They just have to know what bad consequences to expect if they do certain things. Um, uh, but I mean, it's true that, uh, um, no matter how hard the sovereign tries to educate everyone, it's not gonna work by getting everyone to read Leviathan and understand all the arguments according to Hobbes. It's, it's very rare to be able to think this way. So uh, the sovereign may have to understand it, right? Which is why he says he, he agrees with Plato that maybe there won't be a true commonwealth until the ruler is a philosopher, <laughs> right? But, um, uh, um, but yeah, so, uh, so, you know, so for the most part, the Commonwealth is running on this and it kind of works, but it's not that reliable and it might need something else to back it up. Um, so, I mean, so religion has something to do with that. I, think. I, I don't know if that helps it. Yeah, a little bit, yeah. I think I just need to keep going. Well, I mean, no, I mean, there may be something that I'm, yeah, it is a little confusing. I did say to begin with, you know, that the reason that it's important that the Commonwealth is made of rational animals. 
Um, that's what allows the artificial chains to work. So, I mean, in, and uh, and I think that's what Hobbes says. So obviously, well, again, it's like, this is kind of, this plus this yields a, is a kind of rationale. And, and maybe sometimes he calls it reason. But true reason involves something else. Reason, right? Deducing things from definitions of words, and most people don't understand that. So, um, right. So that's why he says that this is a different degree of the same excellence. Right. This is the excellence. This is already the excellence that humans have over over other animals, according to him. That they. Um, Try to they they try to think about how to get certain effects or what the causes of certain effects might have been. Um, but there's a different degree of the same excellence, as he puts it, which is this. Um, so um, so how is it that reason comes in here? Well, um, so. Hobbes explains that um, religion in this sense, as opposed to superstition, comes from a certain kind of reasoning about causes. Um, this is back in chapter 12, on page 64. It's in paragraph six. Um, but the acknowledging of one God, eternal, infinite, and omnipotent, may more easily be derived from the desire men have to know the causes of natural bodies and their several virtues and operations than from the fear of what was to befall them in time to come. So, Right, like first, I mean, there's a couple things going on here. First of all, although this inquisitiveness about causes is universal, it's only universal so far as causes of my own good or evil fortune. Right, other than that, it's variable. Some people have more of it and some people have less. Everyone's at least inquisitive about the causes of their own good and evil fortune. So the beginning of the belief in the kind of God he's talking about now is, that the inquisitiveness goes farther, right? And you start to ask about the causes of natural bodies and their several virtues and operations without worrying, without being a connected to what you expect to happen to you in the future. This, this again, this is this rare desire for knowledge that he, that he mentions now and then, right? That some people, although most people desire um, wealth and uh, power and sensual pleasure, some people desire knowledge. So, um, for he that from any effect he seeth come to pass should reason to the next and immediate cause thereof, and from thence to the cause of that cause, and plunge himself profoundly into the pursuit of causes, shall at last come to this, that there must be, as even the heathen philosophers confessed, one first mover, that is a first and internal cause of all things, which is that which men mean by the name of God. And all this without thought of their fortune. So, um, right, so this is, I guess what's known following Kant as the cosmological proof of the existence of God, right? Everything, every, everything contingent must have a cause. The series can't be infinite. There's all the arguing that has to go on there why the series can't be infinite. But anyway, the series can't be infinite. So there must be one first cause and that's God. Um, so it's a pretty traditional proof. Um, and well, as, as Hobbes says, right? Because Hobbes says even the heathen philosophers reached this conclusion. Um, 
Curly, the editor, says that the reference is to Aristotle. But there's something a little bit weird about that, if it's true. Because turning to chapter 31, where he's talking about what is honorable or not honorable to say about God. And why he's interested in that, I'll come back to you later. But um, this is on the list of things that are not honorable to God. To say that the world was not created, but eternal, seeing that which is eternal has no cause, is to deny that there is a God. So Aristotle thought the world was eternal not created. So um, if he's really re alluding to Aristotle here, then there's something strange because here he's saying whoever he's talking about has concluded that the world has a cause using this cosmological proof. Um, so it's possible he's thinking about Plato rather than Aristotle. Um, it's also possible that he thinks Aristotle's view was reasonable given what Aristotle thought about causes. Um, but it's also possible that he's saying that Aristotle's view doesn't have anything wrong with it, except that it isn't a good thing to say about God. Right? That is, you might say from a theoretical standpoint, there's nothing wrong with it, but from a practical standpoint, it, there's a problem. Um, and I don't know how to decide between those things, but it is, um, um, it might be important to try to figure it out. In any case, um, whatever he thinks of Aristotle, he's, you know, I mean, so most Aristotelians, like, um, so most Aristotelians were either Platonists or um, Muslims, Jews, or Christians. <laughs> um, and they all, and so they, they um, many though not all of them uh, concluded that this was a place that Aristotle had made a mistake. So they mostly believed that the world was created in um, so, uh, so like I said, this, you know, Hobbes' version of this proof is pretty traditional, even if it can't be found in exactly this form in Aristotle. Um, so, uh, um, what does it prove the existence of? Well, I mean, you know, so this is something you always need to ask when you see a proof of the existence of God in the philosophy. What have they proved the existence of? <laughs> you, you have to be super careful about that. Um, so in this case, well, we prove the existence of something that doesn't itself have a cause but is at the origin of all the series of causes of things that we see. So I think, you know, um, Hobbes at least thinks that you can conclude from that that this thing couldn't be finite, it couldn't be a body. And therefore it's incomprehensible because we only have ideas of bodies. So, so the result of this proof is that, we, I mean, a less religious sounding way of putting it would be, we don't understand where everything came from. <laughs> it's not, couldn't be anything we understand. <laughs> um, but we don't understand how there could be an infinite series of causes either, because again, we can't conceive the infinite. So, um, so you could express that by saying an infinite, in infinite incomprehensible being created the world. Um, and this is the conclusion of reason based on these same principles.
So, I mean, so it, it, it seems like Hobbes is, um, and, you know, and again, as I said before, like, so if Hobbes was notoriously an atheist, um, and yet there's a proof of the existence of God, I mean, there's various ways of explaining that. You know, one is that uh, he's not really serious about that proof and people knew it or something like that, which is not ridiculous in this case, because as I said, he did make up his own new proof. It's a pretty traditional proof. But on the other hand, another way of explaining it is that people understand that what that proof proves exists is not what, although he says that's what this is what men call God, that it's not what men call God. <laughs> right? So, I mean, this similar issue with Spinoza, who uh, like the whole Spinoza's ethics is all about God. He says that he says nothing exists except God, and yet again, Spinoza is a notorious atheist <laughs> because people say you can call it God, but you're talking about the world, you're not talking about God, right? So, uh, um, um, so it, I mean, in this case, it's like. It's hard to say because, you know, because the conclusion that God is incomprehensible is also pretty traditional, right? And the saying that we can only describe God with negative predicates is also pretty traditional. <laughs> like all those things. And yet, um, when you put them all together in Hobbes' system, it ends up looking like, um, If you really believe this, then you don't really think that you're adding any these various things you say by adding mention of God. So, um, in particular, I was trying—I was arguing that last time about the practical consequences of believing in God. Right. So remember, I you know um, went into the question: Why are the laws of nature divine laws? And Hobbes says that if we consider them, quote, as delivered in the word of God, that by right commandeth all things, then they are properly called laws. But I pointed out that according to Hobbes, God doesn't command in the same sense we do. Because God doesn't have a will in the sense that we do. And commanding someone is, is telling someone to do something because of your will, because God doesn't have a will. Not the way we do, according to Hobbes. And God doesn't have a will in the sense we do because God is infinite. And an infinite being couldn't have desires or aversions because it doesn't need an infinite. Right? Like nothing could be added to it. Um, and so you can conclude that God's so-called right to command is just God's absolute power to reward and punish. But I also pointed out that divine punishments are just the natural evil results that are foreseeable by reason or alone from our actions. Right? So like if 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 you're this person and you're using reason to set up your relig your religion. So when you stop for when you stop for a moment thinking about the origin of the cosmos and whatever, you start to worry about your own good or evil fortune again. You again use reason, and you use reason to try to deduce what will be the consequences of acting in certain ways, and from that you derive the laws of nature, because you see that if people obey the laws of nature, uh, necessarily the result will be good, and if they don't, the result will be bad. Um, so, um, um, and Hobbes says those good or evil results are the divine rewards and punishments. Right? Again, he said, I read this last time, I won't go back to read it again, but he said that divine rewards and punishments are connected to the actions that they're rewards and punishments for by natural laws. They're foreseeable by reason. 
right? Like, so for example, he's one of the examples he has is one of the examples he has is his temperance is punished, but in, intemperance is punished by sickness, right? Like, if you drink too much, you'll get sick. That's the punishment. That's the divine punishment. And, and it's, I mean, again, it's really backwards, right? It's because you perceive this thing that you make it a law not to do it, if you're reasonable. And then if you like, you could call it the punishment. <laughs> right? But so, uh, so another example Hobbes gives is that um, uh, negligent government by princes leads to rebellion. That's the punishment, right? So again, like if I was saying last time or last time or the time before, you know, if the agents of the sovereign go out and start like shooting people, innocent people for no good reason, uh, and people start to feel like um, you're no safer being innocent than you are being a criminal, then uh, there'll be rebellion. And that's the punishment. <laughs> right? The punishment is that society will fall apart and the sovereign will no longer be sovereign. <laughs> yeah. Who's that punishment to? The people in the society or the sovereign? Well, that's a punishment to the sovereign. But then the next thing Hobbes says after that is, that rebellion leads to slaughter, right? So <laughs> for the sovereign, the punishment is rebellion. For the rebels, the punishment is slaughter. <laughs> that's the destroy its own the thing that they created it, or that created it. Yeah, it's just, I mean, but the point is it's all natural consequences. Yeah. So this punishment within the time well, I mean, he says that's what we call a divine punishment, right? I mean, you know, uh, how how would so like for a punishment to be effective, it has to be announced that this is going to be the punishment if you disobey the law. How can it be announced to everyone using just their reason that something is going to be a punishment if they disobey the law? It has to be a natural consequence. So that's the divine punishment. That's what Hobbes says. Yeah. So and he's not the only one who says this, right? Although other people like Leibniz says this a lot. But yeah. But isn't uh, like the institution of the sovereignty a artificial construct? So like how do you say it's like a natural there's a natural law applied to it? Oh well, does it you mean how is a natural law applied like, to the sovereign? Yeah, like this consequence that results, like how do you say because it's you know I don't know. <laughs> Look, it's really I mean, you know, the the whole thing about laws and rights and punishments and whatever, like I mean, you could always look through to what's actually going on according to us. You know, like there's one person here, let's say it's a monarchy. Again, it's, this is more complicated. If, like it's democracy, the sovereign is the same as all the people, right? Just like with different hats on. But um, but let's say it's a monarchy. So here's the sovereign. I drew this picture before, and here's the Commonwealth. The sovereign is not a subject, right? The sovereign is not a member of the Commonwealth. But um, so there's certain laws of nature, like the law of equity, which says that if you're going to judge between two people, you should judge fairly. Right? Uh, Hobbes says when he discusses the example of Uriah being killed by David, he says that was a violation of equity. Well, this is also sometimes why he says the sovereign can't be can't commit injustice, but can commit iniquity, which means lack of equity. <laughs> right, but anyway, so um, so there's a law of nature, equity. So now, I mean, that law of nature, like all laws of nature, always applies. But normally, in a state of nature, it only applies in foro interno, in the internal forum, which means that 
um, what you should do is wish that this law would be followed. Right? Meaning it would be a good idea to wish that this idea would be followed. But here in this special situation where there's this big commonwealth right here on the maybe the sovereign, now there's right. So in the state of nature, normally, I mean, you don't, there's no commandment to go farther than that. Because if you just started judging everyone equitably in the state of nature, they would just take advantage of it. Right. But here where there's this peaceful commonwealth and you're their sovereign even though you're not subject to the law of the commonwealth, the law of nature that advises equity in order to preserve peace. Now there's real consequences to whether you observe it or not. And that's all it means to say that like the sovereign is, you know, uh, not subject to the civil law, but subject to God's law, you know, right? It just, it means that this, that Although the sovereign can't be punished by the Commonwealth, the sovereign will be punished if they govern neglectfully, because a natural consequence of it would be rebellion, right? So that, you know, like I said, if you, you know, if you're, if you start getting a puzzle about where does the right come from, or who does, you know, like, um, by what authority is the sovereign obliged or whatever, just remember to Hobbes, it all comes down to like, are there going to be bad consequences if you do this? <laughs> That's, you know, so, um, um, So anyway, it's like, so to summarize the conclusion I reached last time because of all the things I just said, if, if I say, you know, the laws of nature, if I regard the laws of nature as actual laws, not just good advice, because they derive from God, if I understand that properly, the way this person would understand it, if I understand that properly, um, I'm not really adding anything to my original motive for following the law of nature. Um, all I'm adding is the idea of God as an incomprehensible explanation for the way everything is, right? So like the way the world is, it's a good idea to follow these laws. <laughs> you know, the, law, the world contains rational beings other than myself. And, you know, they have the power to cause me pain and pleasure, et cetera. Right. So given the way the world is, it's a good idea to follow these laws. And why is the world that way? Well, we don't understand, or to put it differently, God created the world. Right? That, so when I say, you know, the reason to cause the, to follow these laws is they're God's command, all I'm adding to my reason for following them is, oh, and by the way, like the world is the way it is because of God. Um, and again, like, so you can see why, if you, why, if you understood that that's what he was saying, you might conclude that he was an atheist. Um, however, in chapter 31, Um, Hobbes does derive a special practical duty from the consideration of God, right? This appears to be something that, that's like, it's not one of the laws of nature, but it seems to be somehow derived from the existence of God through reason. And uh, because he says reason implies that we should honor God and that the means of honor is worship. So, I mean, if that's true, um, 
I mean, there's different things you can mean by religion, right? Like, so far, we've been talking about religion as if it was just a matter of believing certain things or saying you believe. Um, but, uh, in, you know, the things that we really call religions always have more than that. <laughs> right? They always have ceremonies and, you know, officials and so on and so forth. Um, so it's, I think it's only in chapter 31 where Hobbes is trying to give a rational explanation of that. To try to explain why in this like true religion, there might be some form of worship. I mean, I think he already explained pretty well back in chapter 12, why you expect this kind of religion to involve ceremonies and priests and so forth because uh well ceremonies because they're like they're magic right you know they're like omens and you know uh um theurgy and theomancy right like figuring out what's going to happen or getting things to happen by manipulating gods <laughs> um but priests because he says that um, uh, some people always realize that um, that people are looking for explanations like this, and they put themselves forward as that wise person who's your friend who's going to tell you, right? And they do that for different motives. But anyway, not, it's not that hard to understand why they would do that. So, um, but in chapter 31, he seems to be explaining why there would actually be, um, uh, there's a root in reason for the idea of worshiping God. But it's very hard to understand what he says about that. So in chapter 31, paragraph eight on page 30, uh, Page two thirty eight. Mm. Okay. Some Oh, no, it is there. Okay. Oh, okay, yeah, here we go. So um, it, it, it's, it's hard to find because it's mixed up in a discussion of the etymology of the word culture and the meaning of cultus in Latin and whatever. But so here it is. Um, it signifies as much as courting, that is a winning of favor by good offices as by praises, by acknowledging their power and by whatsoever is pleasing to them from whom we look for any benefit. And this is properly worship. Right? So worship means uh, the kind of thing we do to powerful human beings when we want something. From them. We praise them, we acknowledge their power, we do whatever is pleasing to them. Um, now, like, it's pretty clear why human beings would like to be worshipped in that way, right? Because all of those things add to their power, 
being praised adds to their right, adds to their honor, which adds to their power, etc. Um, but uh, but of course, human beings always want to add to their power because their power is always higher. So uh, that explanation could not apply to God. So um, Hobbes acknowledges that, but it's not clear what he's doing with it. So this is chapter 31, paragraph 13 on page 239. The end of worship amongst men is power. For where a man seeth another worship, worshiped, he supposeth, supposeth him powerful and is readier to obey him, which makes his power greater. But God has no ends. Great right? God, God doesn't want any. God has no ends. The worship we do him proceeds from our duty and is directed according to our capacity by those rules of honor that reason dictateth to be done by the weak to the more potent men in hope of benefit, for fear of damage, or in thankfulness for good already received from them. So he's saying, like, uh, there's no reason for God to want us to worship. But here's what worship is. Act as if God were a powerful person and like, wanted stuff from you. Um, so why do that? Why would it, I mean, this is just a complete non sequitur, right? He just finished, said, he said the end of Worship among men is power. And then he just said why that doesn't make sense with respect to God. And then he says, so you should do the same thing to God that you do to men. <laughs> so I think the answer why these two go together is in paragraph 11, back on two, page 238. So he makes a distinction between commanded worship and free worship. Um, so when worship is commanded, it is not the words or gesture, but the obedience that is the worship, right? So if someone tells you, like, worship me by bowing down and you bow down, then the worship is actually obeying what they told you to do, is what he's saying. But free worship, so free worship means that they didn't tell you to do anything, but you're trying to do something to please them. And then he says, but when free, the worship consists in the opinion of the beholders. For if to them the words or actions by which we intend honor seem ridiculous and tending to contumely, they are no worship because no signs of honor. And no signs of honor because a sign is not a sign to him that giveth it, but to him to whom it is made that is to the spectator. So the point is, and the reason it's not a non sequitur in, the, in, in that paragraph um, in the next page is that, um, so when we worship men, it increases their power because we give a sign to the spectators that we consider them powerful. When we worship God, it doesn't increase God's power, but it does give a sign of something to the spectator. So I think, and this is getting back to the question you asked a long time ago, that the reason, reason suggests we should worship God is because so if you're someone like this and you're following the dictates of reason, reason suggests you should worship God because you know that, that your, your situation is rare and that the people around you don't understand things that way. The people around you think that invisible, powerful beings um, who are kind of like human rulers uh, are gonna reward and punish people or doing or not doing certain things. 
um, and um, you want to give them a sign that that's true. And it, it is true based on the way you, you mean the words, right? In other words, they say, um, oh, he's worshiping gods because gods will punish us if we do the wrong thing. And I say to myself, it's true, God will punish you if you do the wrong thing because the natural consequences of it will be bad. <laughs> But since I can't on the spot give them a lecture, uh, you know, of the contents of Leviathan, instead I make this sign that tells them, oh yeah, better be careful. <laughs> um, So if everyone were wise, the only worship would be obedience, right? There would be no free arbitrary worship. The only worship of God would be obedience. Obedience to what? To the divine law. That would be honoring God's power in the sense that it would be um, looking out for yourself in a reasonable way. <laughs> Um, but because not everyone is wise, therefore it's reasonable that there should be like forms of worship of God that resemble the way we worship powerful human beings. Um, and so, uh, like, therefore, as I said before, the advice to the sovereign is make sure there's a religion and make sure it's the same religion for everyone. Um, and make sure everyone worships the, the way you say they should worship. Um, um, So, um, so now getting back to, getting finally to this, the distinction between natural religion and revealed religion. Um, so he discusses this in chapter 12, paragraph 12 on page 67. He doesn't use the word revealed in natural there, but I think that's what he's talking about. He says, for these seeds, right after he's finished discussing the seeds of religion, he says, for these seeds have received culture from two sorts of men. One sort have been they that have nourished and ordered them according to their own intention. The other have done it by God's commandment and direction, right? That's the distinction between natural religion and revealed religion. So natural religion is that you look at these seeds of really of superstition in people, and you like manipulate them for your own purposes. Revealed religion would be you look at these seeds in people and God tells you what to do to like uh, culture them and develop them into the right thing. But then Hobbes says, but both sorts have done it with a purpose to make those men that relied on them the more apt to obedience, laws, peace, charity, and civil society. So, uh, of course, that's the, that's the good case, right? I mean, sometimes they did it with a purpose to make themselves more powerful or to overthrow the sovereign or whatever. But at least... Um, uh, I guess you could look this at look at this as another kind of distinction between true and false religion or religion and superstition. At least in the good case, the people who did it based on their own invention, why were they doing it? Because they were trying to make people fit for society. So everything that I was just saying, right? Like the sovereign can, if the sovereign is rational, the sovereign will realize that we need a religion to keep things right, that people have to be convinced that there are supernatural rewards and punishments and whatever. Um, 
and he'll tell everyone this is the true religion and you better say this is the true religion <laughs> right um and they'll make sure there are public signs of worship and so on and so forth all of that is for the purpose of peace and charity and civil society and whatever the Hobbes says what about revealed religion well why does what does god tell them to do with these seeds of religion god tells them to develop them in a way that will lead to peace uh, charity and civil society so from the outside they're not distinguishable right i mean the difference is that one of them got somehow like immediate speech from god when Hobbes talks about that, he says, we don't really understand how that works unless, you know, people only understand it if it's happened to them. <laughs> and he gives some reasons why it's hard, right? Like if I say God spoke to me into a, in a dream, Hobbes is gonna say, you mean you had a dream? <laughs> right? <laughs> so, I mean, if, God, if I say God spoke to me into a vision, God, Hobbes is gonna say, Oh, you mean you were dozing off and you didn't realize you were dreaming? <laughs> so, um, so anyway, there's this uh, difficult to establish and um, um, unobservable difference between revealed and natural religion. That one involves a true communication from God and the other doesn't. But um, what they're going to do if they're rational, at least, is exactly the same thing. So from the outside, you can't tell. Um, and every time Hobbes discusses God's peculiar kingdom, of which Moses was the king, he emphasizes that God only ruled it by way of Moses. Only Moses went up the mountain. The people said, oh, we don't want to hear God, we'll die. Only Moses went up the mountain. When he came back down, he said, this is what God told me to do. And God made me his lieutenant. <laughs> and the people said, yes, we accept that. So they made God their sovereign, but by way of Moses. <laughs> so, uh, um, like, uh, Hobbes points out that, you know, uh, there were plenty of other states where something like that happened, where the original ruler was like, God told me that these are the laws of this law. <laughs> like, um, why is he saying that one of them is true and the other one isn't? Well, I mean, he better. Right? <laughs> He's not allowed to say, and, and none of them are true. Um, or he's also not allowed to say all of them are true if you look at their rational core and that the symbols that are gathered around them are different, which is like what Al Farabi says, for example. I don't know what it is. Um, so he says one of them is true and all the others are false, but then he makes it clear that there's no way to tell the difference between. Them. Yeah, okay, I'm out of time, but there's one more thing I want to say about Hobbes, um, which is, so you might ask, um, what if you find yourself in a commonwealth where the sovereign has authorized a religion and the religion is teaching dangerous doctrine? Right, like, so for example, the religion tells everyone to read this book that describes prophets making kings and overthrowing kings and criticizing kings and you know etc so like what do you do you're you're not allowed to say that religion is wrong but that religion is going to be a big problem it's going to lead to a civil war so i think hobbes doesn't say what to do but he shows you what to Oh, that's what all that biblical interpretation is. <laughs> what do you do? You reinterpret that book to make it safe. 
Okay. Um, that is all for now, and I will see you on Monday in Zoom land. Thank you, Professor. Thank you.